And what is my relationship to it, to that power? I, I'm a fan of Antiques Roadshow, and I watch it. And one of the things that I love is when people bring paintings in, and, or other art forms, but especially paintings. And I think it's because I am a graphic artist. I'm not a painter, but I'm a graphic artist. So I'm always interested in the idea of putting something on a flat surface, like a canvas or a piece of paper. And I'm really drawn to the, the paintings that come on. And, and very often, most of the time, the, the expert who's there will talk about the school that the artists belong to. Not the school they went to, like UC Berkeley or something, but the school of painting, the school of art. And, um, and that this person was part of that movement, a, a movement, a school of, of artistic expression. It's like anything. It's like music where you have rock and roll and jazz and classical and, and folk music and all that. Well, painting's the same way. And so very often they'll talk about the movement the artist was part of. And a lot of times what I do is I'll jot it down. And then later on I'll go online and I'll take a look at that, that uh, movement. And so recently what I did was I went online and I looked up a list of the, 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 the schools or movements of paintings, of painting styles. And so I just put down just a fraction of what I found, and I want to share it with you. So we have realism, modernism, impressionism, plain air, Paris salon, abstract, abstract impressionism, futurism, cubism, gestural abstraction, pop art, outsider art, photorealism, hyperrealism, surrealism, American figurative movement, Bay Area figurative movement, lyrical abstraction, New York fi figurative expressionism, conceptual art, minimalism, feminist art, artist book, post-minimalism, funk art, graffiti, neo-conceptual, neo-expression, neo-pop, cynical realism, ma maximalism, new European, young British, Classical realism, pseudo-realism, California Impressionism, Renaissance, Washington Color School, Art Deco, Art Nouveau, Classism, Folk Art, Harlem Renaissance, Kitsch, and Romanticism. And that's just a fraction. I got on this website and this laundry list went on forever. And, and, I, and I think that that's so amazing. So basically, once upon a time, what I believe is a metaphysician is that when we look at this universe, when we look at the conception and we look at the, you know, how this universe came to being, is that once upon a time, there was this incredible amount of energy that was stored up somewhere, stored up somewhere in the universe or beyond. This energy was, was moving and turning, and it was raw, and it was, it was hot, and it was ready to explode. And within, within that energy was what we call consciousness. There was an intelligence there as well. It wasn't just purely energy, because as a metaphysician, I believe that everything has intelligence, that the very universe is, is, is filled with intelligence, that we are, we are living in a sea of intelligence, and it began at that time. And so finally... This, this intelligence and this energy couldn't stand it anymore, and it exploded all over the universe, and we had the Big Bang. And out of that Big Bang came this. This. Potentiality. This incredible potentiality. And it drifted down through the universe. It ended up down here, and then once upon a time, we picked it up. And we stood before the canvas of our lives and we began to paint. This to me is what represents potentiality. This is, this is the beginning of all of what I just shared with you and beyond. All of the people who one day picked this thing up and said, what am I going to do with it? And, and the amazing thing about us as human beings, and I think this is true of all of life, because like I talked about last week, it, it definitely happens, we believe, if you, if you look at evolution, you can't help, it, you can't help but say that it, it exists in all life forms because even a little finch 
decided one day that it wanted to have a different experience. It wanted to have a unique experience. So we as human beings, we moved into this place and we wanted to express. And when we look at the variations of what, what goes on in this world, in this universe, the variations in music, the variations in writing, the variations in art, the variations in governments and laws and ways of being, the variations in religions, the variations within the core of us, Different sexual experiences, different attraction experiences, the way we dress, the, 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 the careers that we pursue, the way that we travel. It's as, a, it's as if we walk up to this blank canvas, this, 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 this openness, and we are drawn to expression. When you hang out around little kids, little kids who haven't yet been caught up into, you know, I can draw, I can't draw, I'm good, I'm not so good. Kids just want to draw. They just want to bang on things. They just want to make noise. They want to take the boxes at Christmas and build things. It's within our DNA to express. It's within our DNA to not just ask the question of what's out there, but what's in here. As metaphysicians, we believe that this power... This presence, you know, call it God, call it spirit, call it whatever, is infused in everything. And that we each have, we each possess this piece of pure potentiality. You see, for me personally, that's one of my favorite ways of thinking of God. Because in metaphysics, we don't believe that God can be confined to a word, G-O-D. And I love the word potentiality because what that... What I, what I realize about that is that that means that God is ever moving, ever present. And that when the Big Bang took place and it came into the universe and this whole thing started, this whole idea of evolution and everything started, it was this energy moving forward into pure potentiality. The reason, the reason that we believe is a movement in evolution is not to be hip or not to be on the side of science. We believe it's the only thing that makes sense. Because if you look at the world of music, if you look at the world of art, if you look at the world of lifestyles, if you look at the way we show up, then we believe that the cornerstones of of, of what life is, is on one hand, it is the power, it is the law of God, and on the other hand, it is freedom. What will I do with this brush? What will I do with this potentiality? Of course it was evolution. Because this intelligence, whatever you want to call it, this intelligence that was God, it it didn't want to limit itself to simply making zebras. It in essence wanted to say, okay, go out there, let's see what you can do. It wanted to see its power expressed. And I know that this sounds contrary because we don't believe that God is a person. But in New Thought, we talk a lot about this because we say God is not a person, but very often it feels like a person. It feels like intelligence. It feels like wonder. And I would make the argument that the personification of God is us. And so basically we get up every day and, and, we, and we, want, we want to experience, we want to experience variety. You know, psychology tells us that one of the natures of human beings is we demand variety. We can't stand to have things remain the same. I remember back in the old days, you know, I'm old enough to remember when China, you know, everyone had the uniform on. Do you know what was happening in China? Was certain people would leave one button undone. Certain people would put a tiny flower on their lapel. Certain people would... Uh, untuck the back of their shirt. Certain people would take their little hat. Remember those hats they gave? Little, they cock it sideways. We, we, we crave variety. We crave freedom. We crave expression. You know, Claude Monet, one of my you know, favorite artists, he was, he, was, uh, he was quoted as saying, someone asked him one time, they say, what do you think your job is? And he said, to chase the light every day. I get up in the morning, and my job is simply to take my brush and chase the light. And so basically, we as human beings, 
have stepped into this universe and we have picked up the paintbrush of potentiality and we have moved forward. And that's what the history of, our, of, of, of us as people and the history of this planet tells us. You know, I, one of my favorite stories, and I told this a few years ago in a talk I gave on a Sunday, there's a woman, I read this in Unity magazine, there was a woman in Great Britain who was part of our movement. I don't know what, if she was religious science or unity or whatever she was. But she's a metaphysician. And she lived in a village about an hour's train ride out of London or, or maybe further. And she's a businesswoman. And one day she gets up and she's going to have a meeting in London. And so she puts on her best clothes and her business suit and her best high heels. And she gets all gussied up. And she gets on the train and she goes into town and she, she gets off in the middle of London and she makes her way to the place where this business meeting is going to take place just in time for someone to tell her it had been canceled. So she walked out and she thought, okay, you know, I guess I can catch a train back to where I live. And then she began to look at the city around her. And she thought to herself, she, go, she thought, you know, I would love to just spend a day in this city today with God. Now, this is all metaphorical because we know that God's not a person and God's not outside us. God is ever present. But in her consciousness, she decided, in her mind, she decided to take this, this creative energy that I'm talking about. This energy, this energy that existed way back in the Big Bang. Whatever you want to call it. Whatever, and, and so she, she personified it. And so she had her imaginary friend with her in London on this day. And so she took her imaginary friend out to a great restaurant and had a great meal that was just an absolutely beautiful presentation. And she sat at the table drinking her tea and having her meal. And she imagined, she imagined a conversation with God basically saying, you know that creative force you had, that, that potentiality? Look at what the chef did with it. And God goes, wow, that's amazing. I didn't even think about that. And then later on, she went to a couple of, of, of world-class art museums. And she walked around, and she saw all the different painting styles there were. And she imagined what it was like to tour that gallery, that museum, with God by her side, saying, oh, my God, look at what they did with your potentiality. Look at what they did with their brushes and their paints and their colors. Look at what they did. Look at what they did when they walked up to a canvas, when they walked up to a stone. Then later on, she went into the streets of London, and it was a beautiful day, and she was walking around, and she really began to really, 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 with a capital R, really look at people. Look at the different ways they were dressed. Look at the different occupations, from the cab drivers to the lawyers, from the artists to the panhandlers to the shopkeepers and the police officers, men and women coming and going, all the, different, all the different buses, all the different cars, all the different traffic, all the different styles of clothes, all the different hairstyles, all the different ways of being in the world. And she imagined this idea of being there with God and saying, oh my God, look at what they did with your creation. When they took potentiality, look at what they did. And God's like, wow, this is amazing. I wouldn't have even thought of all this. And then later on, late in the day before she, catch, she caught her train, she went into a bar, and there was a musician playing some music, and there were people talking, and the musician was great, you know, playing the piano. And she imagined sitting there with God saying, listen, listen to what he did with your potentiality. And then at the end of the day, back on the train, going home, and the light was dimming, and it was a beautiful sunset as she made her way into the village that she lived in. And, and, and really taking the time to look at her village, to look at what it's like to move in there, and said, oh my God, look at what we have done. Look at that house over there. Look at that street. Look at that farm. Look at that mailbox. Look at what they did with your potentiality." Oh my God, I never even would have thought of that. You see, in New Thought, we say that within the one mind of God, which is the web of life, the great ether, whatever you want to call it, the, 
The Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest, they talk about the great cedar box that is the universe in which everything is intelligence. It is the stuff of life. We say that all is contained within the one mind of God. But that's not as absolute as it sounds. Later on, I'm going to share with you a quote from Ernest Holmes where he talks about the idea that what is beautiful, what is true, what is wise, what is great, exists within the one mind of God in an abstract way. And what do I mean by that, an abstract way? Imagine the brush. Imagine the palette of paint. Imagine the idea that an artist has before they step up to a canvas. At that point, it's simply an idea. It's an abstraction until the artist takes the brush and puts it on the canvas. And then it becomes completely, absolutely authentic and unique. I have a painting in my office It was a gift to me that means a lot to me by a gentleman by the name of Michael Divin who used to come here and he and his wife and she was a great musician. He was a great painter or are. They moved to another area because um, she works in academia and so they moved. And I was talking to Michael one time about because he taught painting at Chico State. And I said, I said, how does that work to, to actually teach art? Because art is such a unique expression. He said, that's an interesting question. He said, because I think about that all the time. My job when they come into the door is to teach them, you know, brush strokes and ideas and color and to teach them about, you know, the traditions within art and some of the schools of art and things like that. He said, but it's really interesting when a, when a student asks me to walk up to a canvas because they have an issue. He said, I, I, I really think about how I step into that. Because do I want to sit there and tell them and show them what to do, or do I want to turn them loose for what's inside? And Michael always respected the fact that ultimately... You know, he basically told me, he says, I teach art at Chico State, but in a way I don't even think it should be taught because it's expression. It's like any musician. I'm not a musician, but in talking to musicians, there is the basics, but then there is getting cut loose and doing what you got to do to make it your own. We have this beautiful piano in our sanctuary, and look at how many different ways it sounds from week to week, as every artist makes it their own, as they pick up the piano and they make it their own. So basically, our relationship with God, our relationship with us is the idea we take the brush and we we wake up every day and we walk up to that canvas and we begin to paint our experience. We all know what happened some years ago in Columbine, Colorado, in in terms of that school, that that one terrible day where some young people did some things that we can't even imagine they did. And we've all heard of it, we've all read about it, and afterwards there was all kinds of analysis of what took place. So basically, we saw a couple of young people walk up to their canvas and they painted that day. But that wasn't just a canvas that they painted. That was a canvas that everyone had a hand in painting. Law enforcement, schools, teachers, administrations, fellow students. They all had a hand in painting that day. So we all know what happened. We all know the grieving process that most of us went through, no matter where we live in this country. Well, right after that happened in the town of Aurora, Colorado, the powers that be, if you want to call it that, decided to get together. Let's, let's call them the stakeholders. Who were the stakeholders? The stakeholders were local law enforcement, probation, school teachers, school administrators, student representatives, parents. They all got together. And they say, I wonder if we can create something different. And so they did. They began to create all kinds of different policies 
And in a very loose kind of way, they created something called restorative circles. Now, what does restorative circles mean? It means that law enforcement, probation, school administrators, teachers, students, and parents decided that they were going to create circles of healing, whatever was going on in their schools and with young people, with teenagers. Police officers, for their part of it, instead of just patrolling around and looking for trouble, they would come onto the campuses and they would hang out during lunch and other times there was a lot of kids around and they would begin to talk to kids. Just talk to kids. Now, you know, what, what's wrong with you? You shouldn't be chewing gum, you know, whatever it is. They began to actually have conversations. They began to be seen. When they saw kids around town that they'd met at school, they would pull over and just say hi to them. You know, not, not ask them questions, not write them a citation. How was your day at school today? They got to know kids in terms of their, their interests, you know, whether it was sports or skateboarding or academia or whatever it was. Now, for the school administrators, their part of it, they decided, you know, instead of just suspending kids or sending kids home for doing something wrong, which is the old traditional way, we're going to bring them in. We're going to have a conversation with them. We're going to bring their parents in. If they have problems on the campus, we're going to bring everyone they had a problem with into a restorative circle and have a conversation. They began to get involved in tailoring classes to interests. They began to encourage kids to come into these restorative circles and talk about their problems and their feelings, their alienations, what was going on at home, what was going on between them. If there was a, a problem between two students, they brought them into an environment with a teacher, a counselor, parents, whoever else was involved with these kids, and they talked it out. And they tried to come down to the roots of it. And then they got the, the students to buy into it because the students had seen what happened at Columbine. And they began to talk about the fact that you know there are kids out there who feel alienated, who feel cut off. You know the kids who have problems before we ever do. And they began to teach kids in how to engage. Restorative circles. So basically, in Aurora, Colorado, they took their pure potentiality, they took their brush, and they said, we're going to paint something different. You know, it's interesting about evolution. What science now understands about evolution is there are certain branches of evolution that are interconnected. You know, we look at, for example, as human beings, we look at our relatives evolutionarily. We look at the relatives of all living things. And it looks like branches that are connected and that ultimately go up and onward and but they also are recognizing there's some branches that dead end. There's some species that go a certain distance and then they stop. And they stop because why? Because maybe it ain't working. And maybe there's times where we paint things in our lives. We create things that don't work. Which means we have to create something new. I mean, for my money... What I'm looking forward to, and because I believe in reincarnation, I know I'll be around for this. I'm looking for the day when the branch that we created war with ends. The branch that we created poverty with ends. The branch that we created separation with ends. The branch that we created addiction with ends. The branches that we have created that have alienated each other end. And we paint and create something absolutely brand new. You see, in our philosophy, you know, because I'm a minister of this philosophy, one of my jobs is to serve as a counselor. And counseling for me in this, in this philosophy is very interesting. Because when someone walks into my office and says, I have a problem with a relationship, and I say, okay, what's the relationship? And they explain it to me. You know, unless, unless someone is being physically hurt, unless someone is being physically abused, my job is to simply say, okay, let's work with that. Whatever it is. 
I mean, I, I know that there must be some denominations out there that if you were to walk in and say, this is my relationship, they'd say, well, that is a wrong relationship. That has to end. But basically, my job is to say, okay, it's a relationship. You've created it. What do we do with it? That's why in our philosophy, we have no problem with sexuality. You know, gay, straight, sock puppets, whatever it is. It doesn't matter to us. And we're not, we're not that way to be cool. We're that way because we simply say, this is your self-expression. This is what you have painted. This is what you're doing. This is what you took your pure potentiality to. This is your life. You went out there one day and you grabbed a hold of that brush and you said, I'm going to paint something else. You know, Julie talked about earlier, and some of you know, you know, some of the transformations that are taking place around here. You know, taking a bookstore out, putting a meditation room in, selling a piece of real estate, restructuring ourselves, bringing in new tables. Why? Because we're painting a new picture. It's called transformation. It's called evolution. It's called change. It's called, what is my relationship to this power called God? How would it be if we walked up to somebody we loved and we handed them a paintbrush and it never, it never touched the canvas? How would that be? Well, see, we have a paintbrush and we're going to touch the canvas. And we're going to show up in that situation. So the question is, what is my relationship as a human, as a personal, you know, personally, my, my question every day and part of my spiritual practice every day is to say, what is my relationship with this power that we call spirit? Spirit. 